Mina, come down wide. Jesus freaking gamer here. Tonight I've got. Yeah, this isn't gonna be a what would you do thing because it's something that already has happened. And I think all of us, once you hear the story, I think we're all gonna be agreed on what we would and would not do. Maybe not. But um, this right here, I ran across something tonight when I was reading in Second Samuel chapter twenty-one. And this has been a question I've had for several years, and over the years, you know, you get questions, and you eventually get answers. It usually branches off into more questions. Well, this one, <coughs> this is a question to which I have no answers whatsoever. Right now, this story, it has been a question mark in the back of my mind for a long time. I'm like, okay, I don't understand that. I'll have to look into that one day. I've been reminded of it today, and I still don't have any answers. I didn't do a Google search before doing this video, so I'm still in just a giant... I have no idea what to think of this mindset. Let me just read you the verses, and I think it will become abundantly clear very quickly why I'm just like, huh? So 2 Samuel chapter 21, I'm just going to start at verse 1, I'm just going to read. And there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered, it is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Therefore David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement, that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said to him, We will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Then they answered the king, As for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, so I guess that's a different Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Mitchell, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Meh Meholathite, some of these names are kind of wild, and he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of barley harvest. I, I, the reason I'm not saying what would you do, I think all of us would agree. We would not kill those men. The men of Gibeah said, to we were not going to ask you to kill anyone for us. And they said, we're not going to ask you to kill them for us. Deliver these men up to us that we may hang them. So yeah, you don't kill them, King David. We'll kill them ourselves. What? How are they responsible for what Saul did? How is that possibly just in the sight of David? How is that just in the sight of God, more importantly? If this had been just a story that, you know, David had done this thing, I could excuse this as a, a mistake that David did. Whoopsie poopsie, moving right along. And then to cap off the entire thing, go over to verse 14, um, at the very end of verse 14. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. So, God himself, he inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him thus, and at the very end, the Lord heeded this prayer. What? And the reason I'm sharing this is because I want to be open and honest with you guys about my faith and my questions. And I'm not saying this to tear people away from the Bible or tear people away from Jesus or make people think, oh, well, the Bible's chock full of errors. The Bible has tons of mistakes in it. There are things that I question, and there are definitely some typographical errors. And that alone is an error. That's something wrong, and it needs to be dealt with. And the thing is, 99% of the questions that come up have answers, and very good ones. This one, I have no good answers to. So let me know in the comments down below what you think. If you have any answers, again, I just read this, haven't Googled it, haven't Google searched any answers for it. So yeah, let me know what you think in the comments below. Um, feel free to blast me, blast my faith, blast the Bible. Do that if you want to. Um, if you have an argument for why this is understandable and excusable and how this fits in to God's character and David's character at the time, he had repented of his sins at that time, 
how any of this makes sense, let me know in the comments below. I'd be very interested to hear. I don't want there to be any point in the Bible that we don't question, that we don't look at. And I don't want there to be any time where we're just like, well, I don't get it, but, you know, we're just going to keep going forward. Bless God, you know, it obviously must be right because it's in the Bible. While I agree with that statement to an extent, I don't agree with it completely because just within that paragraph that we read there, there are some, like, name changes, like you read in First Chronicles and in First Second Samuel. Some of the names are different, so it's kind of like, well, probably a misspelling here and there. And that's the thing. That counts as an error. That counts as a mistake. So while the Bible, I definitely count as the Word of God, you know, man has his fingerprints here because there are mistakes, however small. But this entire story isn't just a typographical error. It's a giant, I have no idea how this fits into God's character, how this makes any sense. You know, God said in Exodus that the sins of, that the, sins of the Father would not be passed. Well, actually, he said in Exodus that the sins of the Father would carry down to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. But he says later on in the book of Ezekiel that the children are not responsible for the sins of the fathers, and the fathers aren't responsible for the sins of the children, that everyone will be responsible and bear the wages of their own sin. So this doesn't seem to fit in with God's motif, if you will. I'm not going to lose my faith over it. I'm not going to stop reading the Bible over it. It's, a, it's one of many questions that I have. Uh, this seems to be this is the biggest question because I just don't know any answer to it. And right now, I would say it's the biggest question in my life. Like, how in the world does this make any sense at all? Because I don't get it. I don't see any potential answer. And I, I've carried along long, long enough. This has been kind of rambly of me, but I just wanted to, I wanted to be upfront with you guys, and I wanted to challenge you guys and make you guys think. You know, this is not just my faith; it's our faith, or in some cases, the lack thereof. So let me know what you think in the comments. And if this isn't a challenge for you, again, please, I, I, I'm telling you, it's your duty to leave a comment. If this just totally makes sense to you, it's your duty to tell me and everyone else how in the world this makes sense. Because I am positive I'm not the only one who doesn't get this. Thank you guys very much for watching this video. Keep the faith even when you have questions. Eventually, you'll find answers. I love you very much. God bless.